well, comrades, thanks very much uh, for the invitation to speak, and thanks, Jerry, for that uh, invitation. As he says, we've known each other many, uh, several decades now. Um, it's great to be at a meeting of, of Labour International with, with comrades from all around the world, um, and to just share some of my thoughts on how the the pandemic has unfolded in Britain and the response of, of my union and some uh, assessment of where, where what, what might happen next and the challenges we face. I think for trade unions, uh, obviously the pandemic has uh, posed some very big organisational problems um, because of lockdown. Uh, and clearly we, um, we've had to think very, very quickly about how do we operate in different circumstances. So we, um, we, we locked down, we're in a, a, a service where our members have carried on going to work, they've been required to carry on going to work, but we called on our employers um, to re reduce significantly the unnecessary non-emergency engagement with the public. So fire safety inspections, unless they were absolutely crucial and risk critical, um, education type of uh, activities, much training we we called for that to be reduced and that was that was done um but nevertheless they've obviously uh, the, the firefighters have had to carry on going to work and faced how do you deliver a fire and rescue service in in the face of the pandemic uh, and we've also had to discuss what other roles we can take on so as a union we we uh, moved very quickly to move to an online form of organizing we said that the union had to carry on functioning uh, and that would mean um introducing new ways of working so we we use primarily microsoft teams which i believe is supposedly more secure than zoom um and, and we have we now have our uh, brigade regional and national meetings held through teams which is is a very unusual way of working particularly you have to take votes at an executive council and so on but we're we're working through that and we found ways of doing doing that i think for example you, it's, it's very difficult to have a whole day uh, meeting uh, online so we have more and shorter meetings uh, and we've tried to encourage our members at local level to to engage in that sort of organizing so i think there's lots of lessons for organizing and how we operate Actually, that yourselves as, as Labour International, we could probably learn lots of lessons from yourselves because of, of how you organise in any case. But for, for many of us, it was very new. Uh, I think there are some strengths that we can take uh, into how we operate post-pandemic. Uh, um, some things that we would want to carry on with, others that we wouldn't. Uh, we've also had to discuss how we operate as an industry and as a union in the face of those challenges. Now, one of those that we, uh, as I touched on, we have um, discussed how the fire and rescue service in the UK could assist our communities uh, and our and the health service and so on uh, in, in work that we wouldn't normally be undertaking. Uh, and we entered, I think it shows the strength of the union because we, through collective bargaining, we were able to reach a national agreement covering the UK with our employers and the national fire chiefs, so that eventually we, we have signed up to 14 additional activities, which are not contractual activities, but we've agreed to engage in. And we have some four or 5,000 of our members volunteering to do this. So this ranges from driving ambulances because of shortages in the ambulance service, to uh, the training of care staff, care home staff in the use of uh, PPE, to, um, we have the majority of fire services where we've had members involved in the movement of, uh, of bodies, for example, some quite somber and, and uh, serious activities. So 14 of those. Uh, I think the strength of collective bargaining has meant that we built safety into that from the start. So we built uh, the need to assess PPE, to build risk assessments into the process, to identify any additional training that was necessary and I think that gave our officials across the UK in local fire and rescue services the confidence to then engage with their individual employer about how they would undertake those activities. And in turn, I think it gave firefighters on the ground a confidence that, that here was uh, they, that many of them wanted to do this extra work to assist 
society to assist their communities, but they had the confidence that their union had negotiated this. It built in protections. It made clear this was time limited. It was under the control of the union. Uh, and I think on that basis, many felt very confident to volunteer. And we've had very good feedback generally from our members across the country about how that uh, has operated. So I think there's some lots of lessons for us to learn, learn as trade unions simply about how we engaged uh, during the pandemic. Just a, a couple of further points from me on uh, how the pandemic has unfolded, because I think uh, certainly in Britain and indeed across the world, it has exposed class divisions in society very sharply. I think if you look at the figures of how people have been affected, obviously primarily uh, elderly people with underlying health conditions, but uh, the, the figures in the UK show very starkly that um, poorer communities are significantly greater, more at risk than uh, better off parts of society. Black and minority communities likewise. If you look at the occupations who have been the most significantly hit by deaths from the pandemic, again, it, uh, it's some fascinating but stark reading. The single worst affected occupational group in the UK is security guards. Uh, interestingly, the, the worst hit groups are not in the health and social care sector. They are actually largely in the private sector, in security, in driving, bus drivers, construction, food processing, and so on, are the occupational groups which have been most uh, proportionally the worst hit. Um, and again, I think there's some lessons that we need to think of as a trade union movement as we emerge from uh, COVID. I think for us as a union, we, obviously we engage in issues around risk and risk planning. That's what the fire service is supposed to do. And one of the first circulars we issued to our members was to alert them to letters we had written to government ministers highlighting the complete failure of governments in the UK to adequately plan and prepare for the pandemic. We have in the UK what is called the National Risk Register and since at least 2008 that National Risk Register had identified the risk of a pandemic not simply influenza, but new forms of pandemics, such as the one we now face. So they cannot deny that this risk had been identified. Uh, the National Risk Register then also identifies issues about that uh, public agencies should plan for, and that includes the provision of PPE, that includes uh, how you deal with reduced staffing numbers in the event of a, a pandemic and so on. So all these things should have been on the radar. But of course, public services in Britain have been completely undermined by uh, a decade and in the fire service longer than a decade in reality, but a decade at least of austerity policies, which have uh, devastate, devastated public services, uh, particularly in terms of, of staffing levels. So that's one of the things where I think we have faced the most challenge in the health service in social care uh, and also in our own in our own sector. Uh, so I think the failure to plan and austerity are key elements into why the UK is one of the worst performing countries and one of the worst performing governments in terms of dealing with the, the pandemic. And uh, I'll just finish off with a couple of quick points about what will happen as we begin to emerge. And of course, there is the risk in Britain of a second spike. Uh, there is all sorts of criticisms of um, how the government is lifting lockdown uh, uh, with inadequate preparation, um, reducing social distancing measures without any consultation, and regrettably the Labour leadership, again, without consulting the unions, agreeing to, to move from two metres to one metre, um, when, as I was pointed out, in, in significant industrial sectors there are uh, there are major risks to the health and safety of workers. Um, we know that uh, COVID will have a huge economic impact. The government has been, governments across the world, but the U British government, the UK government, has been forced to, to plough billions into job uh, retention schemes and so on. Uh, and of course, the risk is that uh, it's going to have a huge impact on both the public and private sector. Uh, and I think we can expect employers, both in the public and private sector, to launch attacks on workers uh, in coming months. 
I think we're already seeing the significant loss of tens of thousands of jobs, which will worsen in the autumn in the private sector. And uh, similarly, I think we can expect further attacks on the uh, public sector workers as well. Uh, there is the risk of uh, divide and rule tactics being used of playing the public versus the private sector or the private versus the public sector because the job losses are likely, I think, to be worse initially in the private sector. And therefore, I think unions are going to have to think very carefully uh, and thoroughly about how we build the unity that we need to demand protection for jobs, protection for wages and conditions, and the sort of investment in uh, in public services that is necessary, but also to protect the jobs of those working in the, in the private sector. So I think there are huge challenges, uh, and I think we need to build on lessons that people have learned and seen across the world. So I think that's why meetings like this are so useful and so welcome. So uh, thanks very much for listening, and I look forward to the other contributions.